This is practice test number two and problem number six. And the question is, write the electronic configuration of the following atoms or ions, or give the atomic symbol for the corresponding electronic configuration. How many valence electrons does each atom or ion have? Okay, so this is actually a, 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 a compound question. But before we can uh, answer it, it we should, it's best that we review a few of the underlying principles so that this will be easy to answer. And um, one thing that we need to use is a notation that is going to clearly emphasize the, 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 the distinction between a valence electron and a, uh, uh, a, 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 an inner core electron. And that is done by taking into account, like for example, this is the old shell game. Let's look at the periodic table. Okay, first is the K shell. The principal quantum number one corresponds to the K shell, which K stands for Kurtz, which is the German word for short. Okay, and the K shell contains one, two. Uh, elements. Okay, so the K shell is going to be the inner shell electrons uh, that are going to exist for every row afterwards. Okay, and so if I'm talking about a second row element, I'm not going to need to denote the K shell electrons. And so I will instead, I'll just give the symbol for the noble gas which is the filled shell, closed shell electronic configuration, and, and close that in brackets, and then write the valence electrons above that. So that's the notation that's going to simplify things. Now let's talk a little more about what a closed shell does. A closed shell is particularly stable because, among other things, the electron orbital angular momentum adds up to zero, which in the first shell, in the K shell, is kind of silly because there is no orbital angular momentum with an s orbital. But this is going to be true with the L shell, which is the in principle quantum number two, as well. And there we have p electrons, which do have orbital angular momentum. But when we have a filled sub shell, in other words, when we have all the p electrons present as we do in neon, then we have a uh, that that subshell has zero orbital angular momentum because the orbital angular momentum all add together and cancel out. And so this was going to give us a particular stability. And so um, this is going to give us some very interesting things when we get to the, the higher shells. Uh, so if I was talking about a, 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 an L shell, and L stands for long, which is the German word for long, um, I would denote it with the helium in brackets and then have the electrons and the valence electrons only included. And the same thing I would do if I'm going to, so it's K, L, and then M, N, O, P, etc. And so if I'm in the M shell, then I'm going to denote it with a neon. Okay. And uh, when I go through here for the uh, uh, N equals 3, I'm going to have the S electrons first, so the S subshell filled, and then I'm going to fill the P subshell. But now, because the energy of the D electrons, because the D electrons, the three D electrons, uh, are going to, they actually are higher in energy than the four S electrons. So I'm going to come to the next row and start filling the, uh, the 4s before I start to fill the 3ds. These are going to correspond to the 3d electrons. And I'm going to have a couple of uh, 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 exceptions occur that are going to be uh, 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 easily understood in terms of a half-filled subshell and a filled subshell have zero orbital angular momentum. And so as I'm filling these d-electrons, I get 
scantium, titanium, you know, 3D1, 3D2, 3D3. When I get to chromium with 3D4, that is one electron short of a half-filled subshell because there's 10 electrons required in, the, in this D subshell. And so uh, it turns out to be more stable to take one of the S electrons and place it into a D orbital to give me a half-filled subshell with zero orbital angular momentum. The S has no orbital angular momentum, so uh, what I observe for the electronic configuration of chromium is 4S1, 3D5. And then as I go from chromium to manganese, I have 4S2, 3D5. Again, giving me that half-filled subshell. And the, the, this is going to occur again when we get to copper. With copper, I've got 9. Instead of being 4S2, 3D9, it's 4S1, 3D10. That gives me the filled subshell for the D electrons, which has zero orbital length of momentum and is particularly stable. And so this type of an exception we have to note when we go to fill in and write the electronic configuration. So as long as we note these examples, or, or these exceptions, so that it's easy to anticipate and predict them. And so now, given that information, let's solve the problem. Um, problem uh, uh, A is, uh, the first element is beryllium. Well, beryllium is the second row, and therefore I'm going to build it over a helium subshell. This is, uh, uh, this is an inner, not subshell, this is the core electrons for the uh, K shell, the inner core electrons. And the valence electrons, because I'm now into the second row, the uh, uh, principal quantum number is two, and I've got S electrons and I have two of them. So this particular notation emphasizes the valence electrons. So obviously I have, there exists, this color. There exist two valence E's with beryllium. Now I go from beryllium to I've written out all of the electrons, and this is a rather ungainly uh, notation, but we can all already see I've got the helium structure, and above it. I'm only dealing with the uh, second uh, row, and I don't have uh, enough electrons to fill that. So this, these are going to be the valence electrons. This is going to be the uh, core electrons. And I've got 2s2, 2p4. So I simply count my way across. P1, P2, P3, P4. So this is obviously oxygen. And there are, and there exist, six valence electrons. That would be the, the two S electrons and the four P electrons. And so the next example I have is silver. Well, let's look at the periodic table. Silver is in the fifth row, so we're going to be dealing with the 4D electrons. And again, I'm one away from a filled uh, 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 subshell, that 4D10 electron configuration, which would have zero orbital angular momentum. So this is going to be one of the exceptions. And so it's going to be, and the, the, it's going to be built above the krypton core electrons. And so I will denote it as krypton, and then it's going to be 5s1, 4d10. So it gives me the zero orbital angular momentum, and that gives me how many valence electrons? I would count that as 10, 11 there. So there exists 11 
I'm given the electron configuration, and this is truly ungainly. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1, 3d5. Okay, so I've obviously completed the first row, so helium. I've gone through the second row, which is neon. And now I've gone through the third row, which is argon. And now I'm in the fourth row. And I've got a half-filled subshell, which is, and I've taken one of the 4s electrons, so that is going to be one of the exceptions that we were discussing earlier. And so I would, uh, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, let, let's walk through here. It's the fourth row, and it's one, two, three, four in, and the 1s electron's been, so that was chromium, as discussed earlier. We've already given that one, so this is chromium. And these are the valence electrons. This could all be handled. It's much simpler notation to just say argon. So that it's much clearer. It illustrates what's going on. But I didn't give it to you that way on the test. You'll have to figure this out yourself. And now I have five, six. So there exist. So there exist six valence. Now, scantium, two, uh, problem E is scantium 2 plus. Well, scantium is, again, in the fourth row. And now I'm going to take advantage of another little somewhat anomalous thing that occurs, which is not at all anomalous when you understand that, indeed, if I was going to have the scantium, the neutral atom, would be 4s2, 3d1. But it turns out that the s electrons in that are going to be more easily removed than the d electron, which is a 3d electron. And so what I'm going to actually have is going to be, I'm going to take, if I remove the 2s electrons first, I'm going to be left with a, a, a d electron in the outer uh, orbital, or, or in, the, in, the, in the valence. And so I have a structure that's argon 3d1, not 4s2 because those s electrons are more easily removed than the d electrons in this case. So this is an anomaly we will have discussed in the lecture, and I would expect you to know it. And so the last one we're going to have, an example f, you're given this 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Well, we've already filled the helium. And so we're now going through the uh, p manifold, and, or, or the S and P manifold, and they're both full. I have two S2 electrons, I've got all my P electrons. So it's corresponding to the neon electron configuration, which is the noble gas configuration. And now with the noble gas, the, it begs the question, what are the valence electrons? I can talk about it two different ways. I can either take all of the electrons here and consider them valence built above it a helium core. And so if you answered eight, I can see the logic. But it probably would be more appropriate because the, the, the electron neons know the, the noble gas. The noble gases don't share their electrons. They've already got that stable electron configuration. So I would say uh, uh, there exists zero valence. Ease. But if you wrote eight I would accept that as well, because I can understand the logic. Okay? That answers.